0112 influence phoenix arizona usa morning very nice to be here this morning to hear this fine report of how the lord's work is growing that's what we're here for that's why we are happy to always hear the work of the lord increasing and when i got up this morning i thought i did you an evil i brought some indiana weather down to visit you i for my first time i seen ice in felix outside of the ice house you know but this was a on the street this morning ice my wife got up and she said is this phoenix i said i think so i said i didn't think we come in the wrong last night but it was certainly surprising to see ice in phoenix well i said if you can just get roused up enough to come over to the breakfast the ice will all met over there cause the presence of the lord always melts away all the coldness so glad to be here this morning with brother and sister williams and brother rose and all the staff and so happy to be back at the ramada again there is something about this place i see it along the roads in my travel i think about the meetings i've been in here before of the ramada and we're here now to start a series of meetings with our brethren around through the valley prior to the businessman convention and how many ministers are here this morning let's see your hands everywhere oh this is well we're in business all right we still let them know that we are in business too the greatest business in the world saving souls and we ministers are certainly happy this morning to join hands with this staff of christian laymen too for helpers and partners in this work to help save souls to the kingdom of god so grateful for this effort i was listening the other day on a radio broadcast as i was driving along and there was an attorney that said a great remark that i thought was outstanding he said how it is that in this day that we know that we are facing the end time he said and to see laymen and ministers just settle down and not get their righteous indignation stirred to see the world so grossed in sin as it is that both minister and layman should be pressing every moment to the calling of the lord so close at hand and we don't seem to be enthused about it as we should be i was speaking the other day on the subject of being sincere now we believe as full gospel people that we have the truth the truth of the gospel we realize that there's much we can improve on on this and we're looking forward to the time that when all the loose ends of these great revivals that's come across the world in the last few centuries as well since the falling away of the church and then the dark age and then these great warriors came forth for truth and they would live long enough to get it kind of halfway established and then the loose ends would run out we are told in revelation 10 that there will be a messenger in the last day who will gather up these loose ends and bring them together and then the mystery of god would be finished at the sounding of this angel which was a messenger of the earth then one came down from heaven with his hands up rainbow over his head and swore that there would be time no more an angel taking an oath and when we see these things materializing oh how sincere we should be all promises of god are true but they are on conditions no matter how fundamentally right we are we have got to approach it in the right way now men can be fundamentally right and still not receive the blessings of god because it's approached in the wrong way it goes upon conditions for instance when ahab and jehoshaphat was together and ramoth gilead really belonged to israel fundamentally because the land divided by joshua through joshua by god had been given to israel and the syrians was taking the land and filling the stomachs of the enemy with the food that should have been given to israel fundamentally ahab was right and that's the reason 400 hebrew prophets with one accord was prophesying go on up from with gilead fundamentally they were right but ahab wasn't right himself and when this one little man stood up by the name of micaiah the son of imla and saw a vision now one man's vision against 400 trained prophets but the man's vision compared with the word that's the reason he knew it was right and see its own conditions we must be sure when hananiah prophesied and took the yoke off of jeremiah's neck that israel was to be the vessels of the lord rather down under nebuchadnezzar and all the kingdoms around had been given to this heathen nebuchadnezzar down in babylon here was israel making their sacrifices and just as religious and fundamental as they could be but yet their sincerity 
had left it, and they was given down there for slaves to serve Nebuchadnezzar for all these years. And Jeremiah had a yoke around his neck, and God told, had told him, no matter what prophet prophesies, what dreamer dreams, or anything else contrary to what he said, it was wrong. And there stood up Hananiah, Hananiah just as sincere as any man could be, and prophesied with a message, Thus saith the Lord, well, of course the people could clap their hands on that, that's true, and thus saith the Lord. They heal, they'll be back in two years, in the sight of two full ears, and walked up to that vindicated prophet, took that off of his neck, and broke it, and said, Thus saith the Lord, remember, what Jeremiah said, Hananiah, Amen, so be it. The Lord perform your words, but let us remember there's been prophet before us. They prophesied against the great kingdoms, against war, so forth. But a prophet is only known when his prophecy comes to pass. And Hananiah broke the yoke. And then, you know what God told him? I think if Pentecostal people fundamentally, full gospel is truth, but there is more goes with it. Is that deep sincerity of what God has given us, we must approach it with respect and love, and in a humble attitude, I think that's what we need. And now, in these coming meetings, I really don't know where I'm going, Brother Williams. It's around from place to place amongst my brethren. All of you pray that God will help us, that there will be the sick healed, and there will, first thing, let me say first, there will be soul saved and believers filled with the Holy Spirit, then sick people healed, God received glory, and his church grew for the kingdoms of God. And I'm here to help in every way that I can in this. I have, I think, it's mostly full gospel people, the Assemblies of God, and the Four Square, and the Church of God, and the Oneness Brethren, and all together, and that's the way I like it, where we can go to each place and all come together. Pentecost is really not an organization. It's an experience that we find that our little thoughts that used to be in years gone by, that just one group called the Pentecostals was all that got this blessing, we find that God just tore our little ideas all to pieces. He brought in Catholics, Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist. He gave those the Holy Ghost who serve him, did his will. And he doesn't change, he cannot change. His attitude must always be the same. His decisions are perfect to begin with. He has to alter nothing. His words, he's sovereign. He has not to change anything, and he never does change. So we are happy this morning that Christ lives, and as the song says, how you know he lives, he lives within our hearts. And we know that we are sure of it. So approaching the revival coming on from church to church, and then back here to the Ramada for the convention, let's go with reverence and deep sincerity, humble, praying and believing God. Now, I know we stay a little long each time, but I don't want to do that in these meetings. I want to get in there and get the people out and get home and do what I can for the kingdom and take off somewhere and pray the rest of the night if I want to talk a while with the Lord and not hold you up while I'm doing it. And now this morning, I feel like this breakfast is kind of an opening to the, this is the Alpha. And at the last, the convention is the omega of the revival. And now, let's just bow our heads a moment sincerely as we approach his throne of grace. And there's no doubt but what there's many requests in here this morning. But while we're praying and you'd like to be remembered, would you just raise your hand and hold beneath that the secret that you want God to do for you? Thank you. Most holy and reverent God, the Almighty, we approach the throne now as we come up from this place called the Ramadan, we pass beyond by faith the moon, the stars, over the Milky White Way into the presence of God as we stand by his great white throne looking across to that golden light where God alone can dwell. We see between we and this altar, there's a bloody sacrifice laying there as a brother and sister, so I expressed it a while ago that one named Jesus, and he promised when he was here on earth, if you ask the Father anything in my name, I'll grant it. There we see him today, standing there to make good every word and every promise that he made. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you will let us come into thy presence with sincerity and with faith, believing now that you will answer this that we are asking. And the first of all things we ask 
for ourselves the forgiveness of all our trespasses and all the things that we have did, which would be innumerable, Lord. And we pray that you will forgive us and let that precious blood of the sacrifice on the altar this morning cleanse us from all unrighteousness, all selfishness, and all that's contrary, Lord, to the great commandments and the desires for us. May we this morning, Lord, in another way or in another time, consecrate ourselves to thee and in our humility believe that you are going to start a revival for this valley. And we are so weak, Lord, to try to undertake such an effort. It would be totally impossible, but thou, O God, can take the weak things of the earth and can make mighty works of God by them. We humble ourselves as believers and asking that you will take these weak vessels and will work your works through them that we might see a great results when this meeting is over, that the work of God has begun to be made manifest afresh in this valley. Bless all our brethren, the churches, each denomination, all of its members, and this businessman, this lady who has consecrated their lives to thee. We pray, Father God, that you will bless them in their coming convention. All together, Lord, work your glory through us, that others might see the good things of God and long to serve him. We commit these things to you with love and respect and faith in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I'd like this morning, God willing, to open a scripture, if you wish to now, to the book of Isaiah. And this being a businessman's meeting, yet their main business is getting souls right with God. That's what they're dedicated to. And we are wanting to speak on the gospel and the sincerity and the approach to it. And let's begin reading now from Isaiah 6, the first chapter, or the first verse of Isaiah 6, reading down, including the eighth. And in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphims, each had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried to another, said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the doors moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a life coil in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this has touched my, thy lips, and thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. And I heard the voice of the Lord, saying, Who shall I send, and who shall go for us? And then said I, Here am I, send me. I wish to draw from this little text some context on some notes that I have written down here, and if I should give it a title, I would like to call it Influence. You know, there are so many of us, and most of all of us influence somebody by the things that we do and the way we live and the things we say. We influence somebody. Somebody is watching your life. And then when we profess to, the, to be Christians, what type of life should we live if somebody is watching us? And your life that you live will reflect an influence on somebody. And that might, it might be the, the eternal destination will rest upon the way that you live and the things that you do, for they watch you. In our text this morning, as influence, we find that this King Uzziah was a great influence to Isaiah. The young prophet Isaiah had been called to his side, and being a noted vindicated prophet of his day, and he had a, I believe, the way that Isaiah spoke it, he was a, had a great influence upon Isaiah. Now, we find that Uzziah was called to be king at the age of about 16 years old, after his father's death, and his father was a great believer, and he had his mother also, was a very fine woman. And this young king had been crowned at a young age, and quickly he taken the road that was right, because of the influence of a godly father and a godly mother. And I think that's a very fine example for we parent today. It's to set an example before our children. Now, you'll live your best and your worst at home. And I think that our lives, though the children might not just exactly act like they are noticing it, but they are noticing it. Don't you never think that they are not because they are watching. 
Not only the children are watching, but the neighbors are watching. Not only the neighbors are watching, but the all that you are associated with watch you. The people at your church watch you. The people that you do business with in the markets, they are watching you after your confession. And we should always try to reflect Christ in everything that we do. I know a little motto that I had hanging in my house many years ago. I picked it up one day when at Bill Sunday's Tabernacle, when I was at one of the meetings up at Winona Lake, and I liked it so much till I got it. I hung it up in my house, and I kept it until it just fell apart. It was something like this, go no place you would not be one to be found in Jesus should come. And be saying nothing that you would not want to be saying if Jesus should come. And it went on with many things, saying what you otherwise, whatever you do or say, or whatever action that you're performing, do not do it if you would not want to be caught in a position when Jesus comes. If we could only do that, I'm sure we would be a great influence upon our associates. And you know the right, there's two ways to do anything that's right and wrong. I had my little son Joseph on my lap the other day. And I said to him, he's eight years old, and some little boy had stepped on his toes. And he and the little boy had a fight. And so I said to Joseph, don't do that. He said, but daddy, he did such and such. I said, but that doesn't matter, see. What he did, just remember Joseph that you love your father. He said, yes, daddy. I said, remember that people are going to look at your life as a minister's son. And then if you do anything wrong, then they are going to say, does this minister permit his child to do such? Now, we know they do it anyhow. But we know that as Christians, we know that we try to bring up our children right. But it's a good thing to keep that before them all the time to do what's right. Don't never take that other side. So I said, because you see, that doesn't only reflect on you, Joseph, but it reflects on your mother, it reflects on your sisters, it reflects on your father, and the very cause of the family, what we're standing for. And then what we stand for, it reflects on that, on Jesus Christ. You don't want to do that. I said what our Lord told us, if we are, if somebody smites us on one cheek, just turn the other. And of course, that's kind of hard for a little boy with a high temper to begin with, to think of such things, but place it before him anyhow, seeing that he should not do it. Now, this young fellow, Uzziah, had such a training in his early days till when he taken the throne, he never turned right or left from the thing that was right. He stayed right with it. He never let politics influence him in any way. He was a man who was determined to serve God regardless. And so politics didn't. He ignored all those things. And another thing that I liked about Uzziah was that he ignored popularity or popular opinion. No matter what anybody else thought or what the other popular trend of the day was, he wanted to serve God regardless.